Hey, welcome back to Cath Lab Outreach. My name's Scott. Today we're going to talk about STEMI mimics. In a previous video, we talked about reading a 12 lead EKG. We won't go as far in depth in that aspect of it, but we're going to talk about some mimics that can fool us into thinking, hey, we're dealing with a STEMI. Remember your, your basic, three basic steps for reading a 12 lead EKG. First off, interpret the rhythm. Uh, that gives you a, a 30,000 foot view of the patient, of the clinical picture. It helps you look for mimics, which will be handy in this lecture. Uh, follow a pattern. So we talked about I see all leads, inferior septal, anterior lateral. And then also you want to look for reciprocal changes. Remember, most 12 leads are laid out like this. So we talked about 2, 3, and AVF being the inferior leads, V1 through V4 being anterior, V5, V6, AVL and lead 1 being your lateral leads. So you want to follow that pattern. So on this top EKG, you've got a pretty typical anterior STEMI. How do we know that? Well, first, let's interpret the rhythm there. We've got P waves. Our rate is OK, maybe a little slow there but uh, nothing that, that we need to jump on immediately. Here's our anterior leads with ST elevation. So V1 through V4 represent the anterior wall. So this is an anterior STEMI. And we have reciprocal changes, some ST depression, a couple of flip T waves there in the inferior leads. The bottom one here, we have a pretty typical inferior STEMI look. Our inferior leads have ST elevation. 2, 3, and AVF, and then our lateral leads have our reciprocal change. So pre pretty standard. What happens when we get into the abnormal EKGs? These abnormal EKGs in some places seem to, t to trigger STEMI activation. And it's like there was an older school of thought that said, hey, we, we've got abnormal EKG, let's assume it's a STEMI and get to the cath lab. Uh, the fact is, is if you don't need to be in a cath lab, you don't need to be in the cath lab. You need to be in front of the position that can help you the most. Uh, so abnormal EKGs are things that draw our attention, and it may be a cardiac reason for this patient's symptoms, but not all symptoms, not all problems are fixed in the cath lab. If you think about it, if you're in the ER, if you're in the helicopter, if you're in the ambulance, you can't fix the STEMI right now. You can give thrombolytics in certain circumstances, Remember, data shows that PCI stenting is actually superior to thrombolytics, uh, but you can't fix the STEMI, but you can fix rate problems. You can fix certain lethal rhythm problems uh, where you are. So interpreting those things are very important. So let's talk about these abnormal EKGs. They seem to trigger uh, STEMI activations, and also your arrests seem to trigger STEMI activations. Hey, it's a cardiac arrest. They should go to the cardiac cath lab. Not necessarily. Your V-fib, your V-tac, yes, those are more typically ischemic rhythms. There is more of a push to make sure there's some neurological function uh, in the patient before they come back. Are we seeing some, some survivability uh, in, in what's, uh, what, what they're experiencing? Uh, but your PEA and assistedly arrest, those are typically some other etiology, respiratory, septic, something else is going on. Uh, so not all arrests need to come to the cath lab. So the, the number one cause of false activation at the cath lab I work is atrial flutter. And let's talk a little bit about that, why that is. Remember, 2, 3, and AVF are going to have your inferior leads, and they're going to have that typical sawtooth pattern. We've covered this in a different video. And V1 is going to have your uh, upright P waves. So we mentioned that. So why do these become false activations? Well, when you look at this EKG, it just doesn't look right. Kind of gives you chest pain when you look at this thing. There's something abnormal about it. But remember where your flutter waves, your F waves fall, the ones that are not being conducted down to the ventricles, they can land anywhere near that QRS. And when they land near that ST segment, they can give the appearance of ST depression or ST elevation. Let's look at a couple of these. This is the bottom of the flutter wave, but it lands right where you expect the ST segment to be, so it gives the appearance of ST depression. Here, in this lead, it does the same. V1, you could argue that, hey, there's some elevation in that lead, 
when this is actually just the top of the flutter wave landing right there where your ST segment would be. So when you break those out, you have elevation AVL V1. Those aren't contiguous leads, and we don't see reciprocal changes with these things. Remember, STEM is you want to see two, two contiguous leads. We talked about each of those segments as standing on a street corner, and V1 and V4 through V4 are standing on the same street corner. So they should see the same type of car crash going on. Uh, here, AVL and lead one shouldn't both show that. There, there's something going on here. So the other thing to look at on this is what's our rate? When you find, remember, each block represents uh, 300 milliseconds. Uh, if, there's, if there's two blocks in between your R waves, that's 150. All you do is divide the number of blocks, large blocks, between your R waves into 300. We covered that on the basic EKG video. Uh, do most of your STEMIs have a heart rate of over 150? Well, remember, tachycardia is a very bad sign in your STEMI patient. That's cardiogenic shock. Uh, but do most of your patients have that rate? Uh, every once in a while, but not typically. When you have these flutter patterns, your sawtooth patterns, your upright P waves in V1, that's flutter. Flutter can make you feel horrible. Uh, it's a cardiac reason, but it's not a STEMI. They don't need to be in the cath lab. They need rate control. Let's talk about right bundle and left bundle branch blocks. Right bundle, you'll hear more about left bundle branch blocks with the Scarbosa criteria and the modified Scarbosa criteria that's out there. But uh, right bundle branch block actually trips up more people uh, in the area that I work. So we talked about right bundle and left bundle on a previous video, but just a quick overview. Remember a right bundle, we have P waves, so we know we're on the wiring. It tries to go down the right bundle, it can't. So it goes down the left and goes cell to cell to cell across. V1 sits about right here over the heart. So when it sees that big wave coming towards it, V1 is upright. Uh, so that's a right bundle branch block. Your QRS is wide, greater than 120 milliseconds. Left bundle, same but opposite. We have P waves, so we know we're on the wiring. Our QRS is wide, greater than 120 milliseconds. So it came down to the, the right bundle and spread cell to cell to cell across to the right. V1 sitting right here saw that energy go away from it. So it's primarily negative. Uh, so it's, we, we talked about our turn signal. So V1, if you're making a right-hand turn, you flip your turn signal up. V1, if you're making a left-hand turn, you turn your turn signal down, and that's your left and right bundle branches. So the part of the thing that trips people up is this discordance. So this discordance of uh, where the QRS goes, the STs go the opposite direction. That's a normal finding in, in bundle branch blocks and pace rhythms. Uh, but that discordance can trip us up from time to time. So here's the transient nature of a bundle branch block. Uh, here, this is the same patient where they spontaneously converted later on. You know, someone saw this here and said, hey, that's ST elevation. Well, no, that's discordance. We have a wide QRS. We had time for, for bunny ears for the R, RR prime. Uh, so we got this bunny ears looking. We got ST elevation, but those are not contiguous leads. Uh, this is a right bundle branch block. This patient spontaneously uh, converted to a sinus Brady uh, later on. Here's another right bundle branch block. We have P waves. We have upright QRS uh, in V1. That's a right bundle branch block. It, it gets your attention. This looks like SD depression. Uh, you could argue, hey, it looks like elevation, but that's normal discordance, not a STEMI. And here's that right, another right bundle branch block where it definitely gets your eye, catches your eye, gets your attention. You say, hey, that's depression. I've, I've got something going on. Uh, but that's not a STEMI. So these are, all of these were called STEMI by an EMS or an ER somewhere. And, uh, but these are just known mimics. Now, can you have a STEMI in the setting of a left or right bundle? Absolutely. Here is one. Look how much more excessive this discordance is in these anterior leads. This is the same patient. And when they resolved, you still have the bundle branch block, still a wide QRS. V1 still down, still a left bundle, uh, but look how the discordant, the, um, the amount of discordance has decreased with resolution of the STEMI. Another thing that's a false activator is early, or a mimic is 
early repolarization. Uh, so early repolarization will have uh, no reciprocal changes, kind of non-specific factors, uh, kind of atypical things going on, not your typical patient. So what is early repol? Well, we expect our QRS to come back down to the iso isoelectric line before our T wave happens. But what happens if our T wave comes early? Well, if our T wave comes early, now that, that uh, the line doesn't make it all the way back down to the isoelectric line, and it gives the appearance of elevation. The other aspect of this is this upward uh, coving. Uh, over here on the right, you'll see this downward cove is a phrase that cardiologists will use. And that's a little more ominous. That actually will catch their attention. You'll see ones that are kind of borderline that go to the cath lab because they have that downward cove. And what we mean there is when you zoom in here and you look at uh, the, the way the ST segment curves, if you finish the line, it kind of looks like a smiley face. None of these things are, are set in stone. There's a lot of gray in cardiology. Uh, and this is part of that. Uh, but when you put that clinical picture together, and we've got this upward curvature of everything, uh, this was early repolarization. Another thing that uh, is, a, is a mimic is pericarditis. Remember, you'll see regional ST elevation. So ST elevation is there, but there's no reciprocal change with this. And actually, you'll have a lot of ST elevation because uh, in a lot of different areas because the entire heart is inflamed. The, the whole lining around all those walls are, are in, is inflamed, and that's what causes that. One of the times to use AVR, there's a few, uh, but you'll see this PR elevation for, sometimes. Not a diagnostic feature, not a home run, but it does build your clinical picture. And you also have this coved up, which is typically more benign than your coved down. So most time your pericarditis will have this coved up look uh, on the QRS and the ST segment. So what are our symptoms of pericarditis? We're putting that full clinical picture together. It's sharper, more pleuritic pain. Um, you can change it with positioning. You shouldn't be able to change cardiac pain with positioning. Uh, sometimes you'll hear the a pericardial friction rub. How good are EMS, especially listening to heart tones and breath sounds. You know, it's not something we do a lot. If you don't listen to it before you get in the truck or before the helicopter spools up, you're not going to be able to get a very good assessment. So the only way to get better at that is frequently listening uh, to your patients before you get into the, the loud environment. So here's an example of that. We've got ST elevation in our inferior lead, some in our anterior and in our lateral, but we don't have any reciprocal change with this. We actually have our PR elevation and AVR. So all those things build a clinical picture towards uh, pericarditis. Here's an example of one, uh, ST elevation in our inferior, uh, a little bit in our anterior, again in our lateral, PR elevation, no reciprocal changes. Uh, so what do we do with that? Uh, well, this is, this is most likely pericarditis. All right, let's look at these two EKGs. Basically similar EKGs. Let's kind of discuss that part. Uh, the top one here, we have inferior elevation. Uh, we have some anterior elevation, lateral elevation, PR elevation, no real reciprocal change. When you look down here on this one, we have some inferior elevation, anterior elevation, a lot through there. Um, no real reciprocal change. You could argue that there might be a little PR elevation in this one. So two pretty similar EKGs, but let's put this clinical picture together. This first one's a non-radiating sharp chest pain, worse when they lean forward. The bottom one's a 53-year-old smoker with multiple risk factors for acute coronary syndrome, ACS. So what's going on here? But when you put the full picture together, top one's pericarditis, the bottom one's a distal LAD occlusion that was collateralizing the RCA. What in the world does that mean? Before I entered the cath lab, I had no idea that was even a possibility. So what we're looking at here is you can get what's called a, a chronic total occlusion, CTO. It's an occlusion that happens slowly over time. Some will say it's, it's as fast as 24 to 72 hours that a blockage could set up. But normally, it's happened slowly over time. And in, in response to that slow blockage, the heart grows collaterals. So... Is this micro? This is microvasculature that's in, that gets 
inflated by blood flow to the area. Uh, that's a thought. Is it angiogenesis that uh, the body's calling for more cells to be created? That's a possibility. Uh, but regardless of the mechanism, uh, you have collateral flow. Now, what happens when what's supplying your collaterals actually occludes? Well, now we're going to have anterior changes on our EKG, inferior changes, and lateral changes, and that's what that guy had. So sometimes you can say this is this the whole clinical picture, STEMI, we're going to go that way. Sometimes there's a lot of gray in that area or in that you know, in that decision, and you have to decide, hey, I, I think you're having a STEMI. I'm, we're going to err on the side of caution and go look. Remember, your, your angiogram, your, your heart cath is your gold standard to prove what's going on with blood flow. Look at this one here. Beautiful inferior pattern. Uh, two, three, and AVF. We have reciprocal changes. Uh, we do have a little bit of lateral stuff going on uh, here in V5 and V6, maybe mainly V6. Um, can't really argue that there's PR elevation, not much anyway. Uh, this is a pretty typical inferior STEMI. This was a 20-year-old kid uh, who had recently diagnosed with a, a, a virus. Uh, started feeling bad, having that chest pain with the pericarditis. This was pericarditis. Now, can you can you leave that EKG in the ER and say, no, nah, we're not going to go take a look? Uh, this is one of those that if you treat patients based on how you are going to sleep tonight, you're probably going to make better decisions. Uh, this is one that we went and looked, knowing that, hey, this is probably a, not a STEMI, uh, but we can't go back to bed knowing we left you with this EKG and we didn't go take a look. I like that approach. I thought that was ethical. But this was pericarditis. And then just a couple more. Your left ventricular hypertrophy uh, does have a couple of criteria. That's a, a known mimic as well. And what we're talking about, these, these, these are the voltage criteria. Uh, but you're talking about when you add the depth of V1 and V2 with the height of V5 and V6, if, if any of those equal out to be uh, greater than 35 millimeters, then uh, that qualifies. So let's talk about that. So what we're talking about is, as this left ventricular wall hypertrophies, you're going to see a lot more energy going that direction towards that thick muscle. So V1 and V2 are going to see energy going away from it, while V5 and V6 are going to see energy coming towards it. Remember, energy coming towards a lead gives you a positive upstroke. Energy going away from a lead, a lead gives you primarily a negative uh, downstroke. Uh, so here are our criteria. When you look right here, you've got uh, 40 millimeters of, of R wave in the in V6. You've got 20 millimeters of S wave in V2. Uh, just that one 40 millimeters was basically enough, uh, but that's greater than 35 millimeters. Uh, so a lot of times the man in the box that spits out an interpretation for your EKG will say, hey, this meets the criteria for it. But this is the criteria they're talking about. And it kind of makes sense. You're seeing a lot of energy go from the right side of the heart towards the left side. Uh, so that is in, more indicative of your LVH. And then finally, hyperkalemia. Uh, that is uh, elevated potassium. A lot of times you're going to see this in someone who has a reason for that. So your renal patients uh, will be a, a primary uh, factor in that. But you have this hyper T waves, hyper acute T waves. Uh, or you have this widening out. Uh, this fellow here on the bottom had a potassium of greater than seven. Uh, he had been had not had been sick and had not been going to dialysis. So you see that wide, ugly rhythm. Uh, so cath lab is not where you need to be. There's nothing wrong with the coronary flow necessarily. You need to fix this uh, electrolyte imbalance. Uh, but be aware those can be false activators. As you correct that hyperkalemia, uh, the EKG will take care of itself. All right, I hope that was helpful, and we'll see you back on Cath Lab Outreach.